To this point, we have introduced the underlying science of forest genetics and tree breeding, as well as approaches to dissecting complex genetic traits made possible by the advances of genomic tools. In this module, we will briefly review some examples of how those, these tools have been tested and evaluated as operational tools. Though primarily driven by the tree breeder, their application is drawing increasing attention from the natural resource manager, since the information learned is relevant to adaptation in all environments. We will attempt to summarize the status and future of marker-informed breeding, MIB, in tree breeding to, include, to conclude this module. Terminology used to define marker applications has become confusing, due in part to the many types of applications and in part due to the whims of investigators. We have chosen the term Marker Informed Breeding, or MIB, to be inclusive of all applications of markers in tree breeding. Within MIB, we think of two major subdivisions, MIPM, or Marker Informed Program Management, and MAS, or Marker Assisted Selection. MAS refers to applications that rely on statistically defined associations between phenotype and genotype to guide breeding and selection processes, while all other applications, as reviewed in the previous model, module, fit within the marker-informed breeding program management portfolio. Marker-assisted selection may simply be defined as a process of using DNA markers to assist in the selection of individuals for incorporating into breeding testing or production populations. By this definition, it should be clear that markers could be used to guide which trees are used for breeding and in which pairings they are bred, which trees or progenies may proceed to field or greenhouse testing, and or which trees are used for production purposes. The word assisted implies that the selection is also influenced by other sources of information such as a tree's observed performance, or phenotype, or its breeding value. It is fair to say that until recently, most breeders held the belief that markers would never replace phenotypic testing entirely, and thus the inclusion of the term assisted. However, there are scenarios in which markers may totally replace phenotyping for specific traits, at least for one or two cycles at a time. Despite the obvious need and desire for an effective mass technology in tree improvement and the continued effort on the part of some dedicated scientists over the last 20 years to find the same, it is probably safe to say that mass has not yet been operationally adopted by any forest tree breeders, any place in the world, on a significant scale. That's as of 2011. Our efforts, though significant, remain largely focused on demonstrating proof of concept and repeatability. There are many reasons why we have not made faster progress in our proof of concept phase of research and discovery. Some are biological, others resource limiting reasons. We will take a quick tour of proof of concept studies for mass and forestry, reflect on the future, and finish with another look at where and when mass might be applied in an operational program. We begin with a very quick look at linkage equilibrium mass based on QTLs discovered in pedigreed crosses. A quick search of the Dendrome Tree Genes database shows 43 citations for quantitative trait loci studies in forest trees between 1994 and 2010. Contrast this with PubMed listings of 3,650 citations for QTL studies in animals over a 25-year period starting in 1984, and a similarly large number for crop plants. Traits most studied in trees include growth, adaptive traits, wood properties, physiological properties, and disease resistance. As noted much earlier in this course, only four or five of these studies attempted to verify associations across time, space, and genetic background. One such set of studies, 
conducted over a 12-year span, looked at wood properties in Loblolly Pine. Let's take a very brief look at how that work culminated. In this set of studies, wood cores were taken from trees from three pedigrees, one of which was replicated in time. The original cross, here called the detection pedigree, was made a dozen years before our study began and trees from this cross were growing on multiple sites. The same cross was remade and a much larger progeny set was established on a single test site, here called the verification population. A second pedigree, not shown in this table, was related to the first by sharing one grandparent in common. Finally, an unrelated population of similar size to the verification trial was established on the same site at the verification test. Data on the physical and chemical wood properties, shown here, was collected for each tree ring individually, both for early wood and late wood, for all the trees and all the trials, and subjected to QTL analysis for each variable and often for aggregate traits, that is, traits averaged over years. In short, these studies spanned over a decade with multiple pedigrees established on multiple test sites covering many acres of plantations. The investment in time and resources, obviously, was large. Keep this in mind as the results of the work are considered in the following slides. We saw a similar slide to this in Module 9, but it is worth repeating at this time. Literally dozens of QTL were detected for every trait. They are represented here by colored boxes that reflect the size of the confidence limit for location of the QTL. Stippled boxes indicate the statistical significance was at P equals 0 0.05, and solid boxes indicate the statistical significance was at P equals 0 0.01. Often, the same putative QTL was observed for the same trait in tree rings representing many different years of growth. In this figure, which includes only four linkage groups, only QTL that were detected more than once are shown. A few things quickly come into focus here. First, QTL for several traits seem to co-locate in the same genomic region. This occurs frequently. This could be evidence of pleiotropy, or simply that we were measuring the same trait in different ways. Biologically, this is a very interesting outcome. Of course, Practical relevance is the evidence, I'm sorry, of more practical relevance is the evidence that this, that specific QTL are not consistently observed among pedigrees, or even cohorts of the same pedigree. This has serious implications for how effective mass based on this approach might be in a large breeding population, such as is common to forest trees. The results of these extensive trials can be summed up in this table, in which only those QTL verified by repeated detection across populations are illustrated. First, let's consider verification of QTL for specific traits across seasons. 62% or 56 of 91 QTL were detected in more than one ring within a population. That is pretty good. Those QTL detected only once may be real or may be spurious. Now consider verification of QTL between cohorts of the same pedigree. 61 unique QTL were detected in the detection population. 44 were detected in the verification population. Of these, only 12 or 27% appear to be repeated observations of the same QTL. Finally, of the 12 unique QTL detected for physical wood properties in the unrelated pedigree, only four map to locations in the detection population. So clearly, for a scenario in which mass for a quantitative trait is envisioned, the results seem not to be consistent enough to support the rather significant research effort required to identify associations in the first place. Our suspicions regarding this approach are confirmed we might conclude our discussion on linkage equilibrium mass with the following points. For most forest tree species, using traditional tree improvement recurrent selection methods, 
selecting for quantitatively inherited traits, and using seedling deployment, linkage equilibrium mass has limited utility. Linkage equilibrium mass may be attractive for special cases that target simply inherited traits and or where selections may feed clonal programs. QTL mapping informs genetic architecture of quantitative traits and has substantial fundamental value for programs that may pursue alternative mass methods. So, in short, we need a better method of mass to be used in forestry. We now shift our focus to studies of discovery that seek associations between marker and phenotype at a mapping precision orders of magnitude more refined than linkage equilibrium QTL, or, as we have discussed previously, association genetics. Ideally, we would like to find the causal mutation for phenotypically expressed variation, referred to here as gene mass. As it turns out, gene mass is likely to remain elusive since identifying causal mutations is enormously difficult and expensive. However, finding markers in tight linkage disequilibrium with causal mutations, called LD mass here, is proving to be useful in forest trees and pilot studies in this area will be featured here. We shall continue to refer to LD mass as the core of our association genetic mapping approaches. Let's take a look at the results of a suite of studies conducted in Loblolly Pine to evaluate association genetic approaches to mass. Association mapping potentially offers great promise to tree breeders. LDQTL and or QTN, once discovered and verified, should have utility in any family or individual tree in a species. In some cases, this association may extend beyond a species to closely related genera. Alternatively, the association may fade in distinct subpopulations of the same species. Biologically, the fundamental distinction between LD or gene mass and linkage equilibrium mass is that we are identifying marker trait associations that identify specific genes or finite genomic regions. However, until tested, the validity of, associ validity of associations must be considered unknown. Consequently, we continue to emphasize the need for verification of associations and more sophisticated studies to understand the nature of gene action and epistasis. Scientists seeking to test the association genetics approach in Lolly Pine have constructed three different association populations over a period of approximately 10 years. The last of these, put together by tree improvement cooperatives in the southeastern United States, is illustrated here. Counties from which parent trees originated are colored to reflect study tree distribution. For this population, two to three seed from each of approximately 500 unrelated parents were sown, raised briefly in a bare root nursery, and turned into hedges. Only one hedge per parent tree ultimately was retained. Iterative cycles of hedging and rooted cutting production provided clonally replicated materials for establishment of three or more field test sites and several greenhouse studies of disease and drought resistance. As noted in Module 11, population structure can significantly influence the discovery of reliable trait marker associations. The program structure was used to test for population subdivision in Loblolly Pine and provided only modest evidence for structure in this widespread species. What structure there was seemed to be associated with populations east and west of the Mississippi River drainage. Contrast this with a similar analysis of maritime pine in Europe in which populations appear to be very distinct from one another, even over short distances. This is likely attributable to the effects of the most recent glaciation events and subsequent population subdivision resulting from multiple refugia.
The modest levels of structure in loblolly pine were accounted for in the linear models used to test for statistical associations. The first published association study in a forest tree found associations between two SNPs in the CCR gene and microfibril angle in eucalyptus nitens, explaining about 5% of the total phenotypic variation in that trait. The Gonzalez Martinez et al. study mentioned here was the first to screen a large number of SNPs, 58, across a large unrelated population of more than 400 trees. Since this study was started, SNP discovery and genotyping platforms have evolved rapidly, decreasing cost and increasing gene space that can be evaluated. While the populations have remained constant, the number of markers and traits studied have continued to grow. The mixed linear models, MLM, found in Tassel, used in the Gonzalez-Martinez study identified many significant associations, even after accounting for kinship and population structure. However, in any study of this size, where the number of tests performed are enormous, for instance 58 SNPs times dozens of traits, there will be many false positive results. This may be addressed by applying analytical tools to reveal the false discovery rate that attempt to correct for statistically significant associations that were detected simply by chance. In this study, the number of significant marker trait associations remaining after correlation, or after correction, was reduced to six. But it is quite possible many of those excluded reflected real associations. A breeder may elect to keep some or many of these in a selection scheme. As just noted, only six marker phenotype associations were identified after correction for multiple testing. These included the genes S adenosyl methionine synthetase, synamyl alcohol dehydrogenase, or CAD, which we know is important in lignin synthesis, and a tubulin gene known to play a role in microtubule alignment. Though the proportion of variation explained by any one gene in this table is small, for those traits with multiple associations identified before correction, the cumulative proportion of genetic variation explained sometimes approached 40%. These figures illustrate rather well the effect of single genes on complex traits. The figures also permit one to speculate on gene action. For instance, the CAD M28 gene suggests overdominance, SAMS2 suggests additive gene action, and IP3-1 suggests dominant gene action. This first study was very much a confirmation of the candidate gene approach to association discovery. The same association population used in this study, called the Warehouser Collection, was used to study water use efficiency and fusiform rust resistance. Though not considered to be a game changer, the results of these studies were very encouraging, especially considering the very limited number of genes and SNPs evaluated. Neil and Savalainen in 2004 have argued that the candidate gene approach to association is the most viable for forest trees and that whole genome scans are not feasible especially since a whole genome sequence seemed to be an unlikely goal for a forest tree for several years. However, it is reasonable to think about SNP detection in the gene space of an organism, approximately 40 to 50,000 genes, and that is where scientists next dared to tread. In the next step, investigators sought to discover SNPs in all known genes in loblolly pine, at least to date. The process of doing so was rather involved and required the development of a customized pipeline for detecting and verifying SNPs in all known gene contigs in loblolly pine. 
The steps taken, as reflected partially in the figures shown here, included collecting all known unigene contigs, obtained from EST sequencing projects, and available in the public database. This numbered some 40,000. A closer look at these sequences suggested that roughly half this number represented unique genes, or ESTs. Primers were designed for these sequences using a high throughput pipeline at a vendor. This process resulted in a further reduction to 14,000 contigs with primers. These 14,000 gene segments, or amplicons, were then tested to determine if they amplified in loblolly pine. This validation process resulted in approximately 7,900 successful primer pairs, which were then sequenced using Sanger sequencing against an array of 16 to 24 trees. From these arrays, SNPs were detected and verified. Over 40,000 SNPs were detected in these 7,500 odd genes. A subset of these SNPs, approximately 7,000, were selected to genotype in association pop populations for the next round of testing. To accommodate the very large SNP volume, new methods of genotyping were adopted, namely the Illumina Golden Gate and Infinium genotyping platforms to seek new associations and confirm old ones. This was the first use of these approaches in plants. Similar approaches were subsequently taken by investigators working on spruce in Canada. As of late 2010, the spruce studies had identified and tested some 19,000 SNPs. Recent large-scale EST sequencing projects for a number of conifers and whole genome sequencing for three species, loblolly pine, sugar pine, and Douglas fir, will likely result in the identification of hundreds of thousands of SNPs in virtually all genes in the genome. With the new large SNP data set in hand, scientists at a number of institutions began to conduct association tests on multiple populations. In this study, scientists used clonally replicated trees in greenhouse studies by artificially inoculating them with disease spores. Each clone was genotyped for several thousand SNPs, though not all markers were informative in all trees. After multiple testing corrections, 10 SNPs, or genes, were associated with quantitative resistance to pitch canker. They represent a broad array of genes as indicated by the annotation table in the upper left corner. They don't explain a great deal of phenotypic or genetic variation, but we can identify specific alleles of value. This is building to a message, delivered later, that we are doing pretty well considering we have only surveyed approximately 10% of the total genes in the pine genome, by some estimates. This particular analysis was completed with a BAM-D, or a Bayesian Adjusted Missing Data method that imputed missing data using Bayesian techniques. Another study, using the same genetic materials as those used in the pitch canker resistance study noted in the previous slide, looked at water use efficiency, nitrogen content in leaves, and early tree height in trees raised in an outdoor nursery bed, subjected to drought. This study, too, was predated by an earlier study that used a much more limited number of markers in a different population. Both studies found markers associated with water, with water use efficiency though they were not in common. Interestingly, about 15% of the genetic variation found in water use efficiency and nitrogen content was accounted for by significant associations, similar to the study on pitch pine resistance. Why are there so few associations with early height? This is likely a result of the true quantitative nature of the trait and the low level of effect of any gene. It should be noted that before correcting for multiple testing, as described in earlier slides and modules, approximately 100 SNPs were modestly associated with height. Subsequent studies have suggested that growth traits can be predicted relatively well with markers in loblolly pine. So what have we learned? 
After a decade of study with considerable investment in development of detection populations, phenotyping of multiple traits, identification of thousands of potential SNP markers, development of genotyping platforms for those markers, and continued development in analytic approaches, we can say that, one, we have demonstrated the proof of concept for association genetics in forest trees. That is, we have confirmed the ability to detect statistical associations between allelic states of known genes and quantitative trait tendencies of traits of commercial and adaptive significance. Two, we have learned that regardless of the quality of our trials, which by all measures is high, that only modest numbers of associations explaining modest amounts of genetic variation are detectable, and that three, we occasionally, but not always, detect the same marker associations in different populations. Interestingly enough, however, the proportion of variation explained is very consistent with the proportion of the genome studied. That is, the number of genes evaluated with our large SNP arrays seems to represent about 10 to 15 percent of the projected number of genes for loblolly pine. This is virtually identical to the proportion of variation explained for several of the traits studied. Further studies are underway to see if associations found in experimental populations can be validated in elite selected populations. We are quite encouraged by the results of our association genetic studies, and there is general consensus that the technology will have utility in forest tree breeding within the next few years. However, as with all good studies, we're, we are left with nearly as many questions as when we started. Most of these are already under investigation in one form or another. Consider the next two slides that come from exploratory work by the Tree Improvement Cooperative staff at North Carolina State University. We can address the first two questions posed in the last slide by looking at the next two slides. Specifically, we are asking how much gain might we expect and is it economical to get it using markers? The results for gain expectations are reflected in this table for different levels of reliability and alternative breeding, testing, and selection approaches in loblolly pine. These values are based on actual data obtained from studies of elite breeding populations and the use of the top 25 SNPs that showed association with volume growth and estimated gain as affected by reliability or heritability of the trait. Those values are compared against the traditional approach to testing using seedling progeny. Use of the markers alone not only saves many years of testing, but yields considerably greater levels of gain under moderate levels of heritability or reliability. Though clonal testing is quite attractive here, note that it takes much longer to complete and may lead to rapid buildup of inbreeding in the populations. Using the same modeling conditions as in the previous slide and the estimated current cost for genotyping as of 2010, the use of markers for this one single trait in lieu of traditional field testing appears to be economically attractive. What if we needed to select on two or more traits? Likely we would need additional markers which would add to the cost of genotyping. However, cost for genotyping will almost surely decline rapidly in the years to come and additional gain in each trait should be expected. In the comparisons made here, the reliability of the seedling progeny approach was much lower than typically seen. We typically see heritability for height between 0.1 and 0.2. However, expected heritabilities for markers should be significantly larger still, and a value of 0.35, as noted in the final line of this table, is credible. So what will we need to truly make association genetics a valid tree improvement tool? For each species of interest, good discovery and validation populations are required. These should preferably be clonally replicated and established in multiple test sites. 
It is possible that these populations could be constituted from existing genetic trials. Perhaps most importantly, we need to be able to test virtually all the genes in the genome for all traits studied. Once considered unobtainable, a recent USDA grant in January 2011 has been awarded to sequence multiple conifer genomes and define the transcriptome. Within a few short years, virtually every gene in conifers should be identified along with SNP polymorphisms in each. We need dedicated scientists and funding to continue to optimize this and other marker-informed breeding techniques. It is likely that funds to continue development will gradually shift from government-supported grants to industry-sponsored cooperatives. The last question posed a few slides back was where and when in the tree breeding cycle might mass, or marker-informed breeding, be imposed. We will draw this module to a close with a series of slides that illustrate the nature and timing of marker-informed breeding applications in the tree breeding cycle. We introduced this representation of the cycle in the previous module and leave it to you to refresh your memory of what is conveyed here. The key to that which follows are the points at which marker-informed breeding applications may be implemented, de designated here by the bold red letters. The following slides will illustrate marker-informed breeding points 4A, 4B, 5 slash 7, that is 5 and 7, and 8 as seen in the slide here. Our first example is a marker-informed breeding application, 4A, imposed at age 12, which is the end of the second cycle of breeding and testing in the controlled cross mainline program conducted with seedlings. The breeder has phenotypic information for some traits, like growth, but capturing information on wood quality trait microfibril angle, for instance, is very costly and difficult. Markers are used to select on this trait, or for that matter, many wood quality traits simultaneously. Though we are shown only three markers here, one might envision using dozens. Our population is made up of many full sib families, designated in the upper left corner here in different colors. Our goal is to select the best progeny in these trials to move forward to the next generation of breeding. In the table at right, we show known genotypes of the parents of each cross for each of the three loci known to influence the trait on the top row. The breeding value of each SNP allele is shown at the bottom of the table. All potential genotypes of seedlings are listed by locus along with their expected frequency, and one can calculate potential multi-locus genotypes by mixing options across loci. Actual selection of the best individuals and families can be done by index or mixed model BLUP in combination with phenotypic information on other traits. Now imagine using markers at the same point in time and with the same population of trees but with a complementary goal to that shown previously. Rather than simply selecting trees to move on to the next generation of breeding, we want to identify the best pairings of individuals to breed to ensure that progeny maximize the number of loci in which they have alleles that confer resistance to a particular disease or insect. The table shows the known phenotypes at three loci from which genotypes can be inferred if one assumes that all are or resistance phenotypes represent a heterozygous condition with the large R allele dominant. The trick then is to identify which of the individuals to cross with one another to result in progeny that have a chance of having the large R alleles at multiple loci. Give it a try.
A logical application for markers in programs with large and costly field testing requirements is two-stage forward selection, designated here as MIB5 and MIB7 opportunities. This is viable for both seedling and clonal propagule testing, though it may be more economical for the latter. Consider again a disease resistance trait. With three known major genes that confer resistance to virulent strains of a fungus, one can select which seeds or seedlings or cuttings move on to field testing by only including those trees that have one or more large capital R alleles. This would reduce the size and cost of the second stage field trials and possibly save a great deal on long term mortality. For the final example of marker applications, we take you back to the module on introductory tree breeding. Recall that genetic gain from selection is generally delivered through seedlings obtained from orchards containing the best selections from the previous generations. Often, seed orchards are established before final selection criteria are available to get a jump start on maturation. Markers can be used to either totally replace the need for phenotypic selection or to complement it in making decisions about which trees or clones to remove from the orchard to give the maximal gain. In this example we once again use a simple three locus model for the wood property trait microfibril angle but we could as easily use a large multi locus data set for growth and yield. To conclude this rather brief look at our efforts to evaluate the potential of marker informed breeding using association genetics and conifers, let's take a quick scan of what one should expect to learn from a well designed trial. The list noted here speaks for itself. Note that all outcomes are not necessarily needed to apply association genetics in an operational setting, but a good breeder will likely want the information regardless. Work is currently being done with eucalyptus and pine, as well as other species of trees, to evaluate another approach to marker informed breeding called genomic selection. This approach, pioneered in dairy cattle, shows considerable promise and may complement or supersede the application of association genetics. It is discussed further in Module 15.